Um, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to be here in th at the University of Heinrich Heine. Um, we're grateful to the organizers of this event. And I hope I shan't disappoint your expectations. Um, I'm going to talk today on the Anglo-Saxon charters, and I couldn't find a better name than just the dynamic of dynamics of production. Um, and I'll try to entertain you a bit because uh, the topic is not very familiar. Could you please? You're actually going to have to do this quite a lot. Quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll try to show you lots of data, lots of pictures, and try to make it in an amusing way. <laughs> it's going to fly. Yes. One more, please. <laughs> Don't you have the, the switcher now? No. One more. Yep. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about the additions. Andres, like eyes up here. Thank you. First, we have the Campbell edition, which is quite old, and but we're still uh, much in debt to uh, John Campbell because he was the first editor who was organizing the first um, academic edition of the Anglo-Saxon Charters. It came in six volumes, um, but unfortunately, the the source critique was not his strongest part. So. We have the uh, new the newer edition, which is Sir Walter de Great Birch, uh, who edited the Cartularium Saxonicum, and um, this is a much finer edition. Uh, it's also available online. Unfortunately, again, it doesn't stand up today's standard standards. Thank you. Um, then we uh, nowadays we have the edition by Peter Sawyer. This is not the edition of the charters themselves, this is just a list, but uh, Professor Sawyer annotated on it, he commented on it heavily, spoke on the provenance, on the authenticity, on the current location and so forth, so it's a starting point for any uh, discussion of the Anglo-Saxon uh, diplomatics. And nowadays, luckily, we've got the digital edition of Electronic Sawyer, which looks like that I encourage you to visit that to visit their website. Uh, it's available. It's open source. It contains 99.9% um, .9 of all the texts. Unfortunately, not all uh, volumes have been published yet, so you cannot always refer to a specific uh, volume. Thank you. Another one. Uh, a little overview of the source. Uh, it's supposed that the, so the charters were first introduced in England with the advent of Christianity, so it should be roughly at the beginning of the 7th century. The problem, however, is that the earliest extant charter comes from 679, uh, and there's a huge debate whether the charters came later than the advent of Christianity or not. Um, then, the majority of the sources, the majority of the uh, charters have been preserved in later copies. For example, here you can see a nice reproduction of a cartularium from the 3rd century. Uh, you can see the script is Gothic already. Another one, please. Uh, they were, the diplomas, the charters, the writs, all together, they were produced very unevenly um, throughout the period. This is a diagram from an atlas uh, produced by David Hill. It still, it still holds, up, holds up and you can see that there's this huge peak in the middle of the 10th century and we virtually, you can see we virtually have none from the 7th century. So we have those alleged charters but which could be spurious, could be authentic and then we have this uneven distribution. Mm -hmm. Uh, as of now, we have uh, almost 1,900 uh, known charters. Uh, there might be more coming, but it's very un uh, unlikely because I think the work has been very productive. Um, the typology can be multifold. You can uh, you can discriminate. The, you can sort them depending on the language, depending on the provenance, depending on the archive, depending on the uh, type of the document, whether it's a land charter, whether it's a writ. So I propose a simplified uh, version. First of all, we've got the diplomas. And um, for example, here's a diploma from uh, mid 9th century. Uh, very lovely um, reproduction. Then we've got the Anglo-Saxon writs. 
the writ is very different from a diploma. For one thing, it's it's mostly written in uh, vernacular. For the other thing, it has an appended seal. This is, for example, a sealed sealed writ writ from uh, around the mid of the 11th century. And uh, finally, we have uh, about a half of of our documents could be classified as miscellaneous sources. Um, for example, this is the opening page of uh, the last will of King Alfred. Um, it's again written, they can be written both in Latin bo and in uh, English. They can be uh, some fragmentary boundaries, basically anything. Uh, su suits and uh, land disputes, manifold. Uh, I will be talking about the diplomas, and uh, when I say a charter, I would usually refer to a diploma unless I specify that I'm talking about something else. Thank you. Um, a very brief overview of how these sources were structured. They're very consistent in their um, organization. First of all, we've got the invocatio. I'm, I put some typical formulae that would open inv invocatio. Then we've got the proem, for example, the, uh, the king, the monarch, would explain why he's giving this land or this estate to a certain grantee. Usually they're highly formulaic and you can rarely find any actual information. But sometimes there's also quite interesting um, in information such as, for example, the price. Sometimes people paid to get an, an estate. Sometimes uh, you can read that this uh, man or this thing was the second generation in service. So sometimes there is there are bits here and there. Uh, then we've got the narratio, that is the main body, which is highly technical. This is this land of uh, 20 mancus, uh, 20 uh, hides in that place, which is in vernacular called that and that, very technical. Then we've got the anathema. I don't think I need to explain what that is. Then we've got the boundaries, they're usually in Old English, which is why um, the English scholars had the opportunity to identify 99.5% of the estates on the map as early as the 19th century. Uh, then we've got the escort call, uh, and that is the witness lists um, and the date. Sometimes they can be absent, which brings us to the question of how, we know, how do we know if that's an authentic charter or not. Uh, but for, for the most part, they are appended at the end. Right um, now, I will have to uh, I will have to give you a little overview of the period. I'm going to talk about the 10th and 11th century, and because I know that uh, the Anglo-Saxon material is not very um, familiar, let's just say, especially in its details. I will have to simplify and give it you a two-minute overview of how it happened. To make it easier for you, I will try to add some humor to it so that you remember the names and the figures of the kings. So first of all, we begin, we begin the 9th century with uh, the joint rule of Ethelflaed and Edward the Elder. Um, contrary to, the, to what you might have thought, they are not uh, a couple, they are siblings. Next one, please. Uh, the next king was uh, King Ethelstan, please. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'll just give you a brief overview of what was happening during uh, these 25 years. So, uh, Alfred the Great managed to secure Wessex from the Danes. Um, uh, Ethelflaed ruled in Mercia, which is why she was called the Lady of the Mercians. Edward was ruling first Wessex. After her death, he was ruling both M M Mercia and Wessex. And he already started the expansion towards the, um, the former ki kingdom of East Anglia and uh, the this uh, borderland where with Cambridgeshire, uh, London and others. Next one please. Then we've got King Athelstan, who is best, he is the son of uh, King Edward, who is best known for winning the Battle of Brunnenburg, again, or Brunnenburg, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, we don't know where it happened, but it happened in 937. We've got an Anglo-Saxon poem telling us the story of this fight. Uh, it was a coalition of the Celtic and Viking lords against the one and righteous king of the English, that is King Athelstan. Then we've got this chap with a fan or gramophone, I'm not sure, King Edmund. He was also the son of uh, King um, Edward the Elder, uh, but from another, um, another wife. He is best known for being murdered at his own feast, six years after, after um, he was consecrated king. The next king was King Edred, who was quite sickly. 
Um, so he, this um, <coughs> graciously crossing leg uh, guy was also the son of King Edward, so it was a long generation. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, both, both Edward and Edmund died quite early, so Edmund was about 27, uh, Edmund was 27 and Edward was about uh, 31 or something. Next one, please. The next, um, yeah, uh, in, in their reign, uh, what happened, basically, Wessex, with its dependencies in form of Mercia, appended all of uh, East Anglia, all of the five borough district, and later, under King Edward, they annexed the Kingdom of York. Um, and so, from then on, we can speak of a united English kingdom, even though it's a historiographical phantom. Of course, no one called it the United Kingdom of Mercia, Wessex, and so forth. Next one, please. Uh, then came King Edwig, who is, or Edwig, depending on how you pronounce him, uh, who is best known for his um, indecent behavior at his own marriage. He was, uh, at least to, according to later sources, uh, which were quite biased against him, he was trying to um, arrange an, a threesome after his marriage with, the, with his new wife and her mum. But uh, St. Dunstan was trying to drag the young king from this affair. Uh, so he was quite a scandalous person, but again, the sources are highly biased. Uh, then we've got King Edgar. Um, so this uh, neck-breaking chap was a another son of King Edward, and uh, he was a little younger than Edwig. They were sons of uh, the same mother, and Edwig was originally a crowned king of the United... I can't go around this phrase, the United Kingdom. Um, but uh, two years afterwards, the nobility in Mercia rebelled and they elected Edgar as their king. And so we've got a joint rule again. Uh, the situation was very um, heated. Um, and if Edwin uh, lived longer, it is not improbable that they might have been a civil war. Uh, Edgar is best known for being uh, consecrated king of the, Eng the king of the English this time uh, on the River Dee, um, where supposedly eight British monarchs, that is Celtic princes or whoever they were, were rowing in his barge. So he was quite an imposing king. Then came uh, Edward the Martyr, who's best known for being killed. Um, being killed at his brother's uh, estate. Next one, please. Uh, this is a nice uh, Victorian style picture of this is the supposed murderer. You can see a little knife here. So he was stabbed in the back. Stabbed in the back. Um, and he, from him we have just a few charters. Then came King Ethelred then Reddy, who is best known for <laughs> losing basically all the wars against the Vikings. Uh, can you please press it four times? This is how it was happening over the time, so um, which resulted in another dynasty coming to the English throne, the dynasty of the Danish king, uh, King Canute, and his two sons Harold and Hardeknut. So this frowny guy is the great king of Denmark. He's actually called Knud den Stor, Canute the Great, and he quite was. And he's best known for ruling a so-called Northern Empire, which united um, England, Denmark. Uh, Norway and part of Sweden, but unfortunately the empire collapsed after his uh, death. And finally we've got King Edward the Confessor, who is best known for uh, being a nincompoop and dying without an heir, which led to the Norman Conquest. Uh, yeah, that's about how it happened. Um, yeah. So now we've got an overview of what we're dealing with. Um, I have to put a special emphasis on, on these uh, circumstances because I think it's, imp it's impossible to understand the production of the charters when you look at them aside from the political situation and the, uh, for example, the inner relations in the family. Yeah, so this is how it all together looks. It's a very simplified family tree. There were m many, 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 many more ethelingas, the princes and the uh, princesses, so it's a very brief overview. Next one, please. Right, um, so what I, what I propose doing is that we'll look at the charters uh, both as the political and uh, in the... Pol no, that was not the plan. Uh, we'll look at them as both acts of political and cultural agenda because as you... Nope, thank you. Um, as you have seen, they were quite formulaic, but at the same time, the formulas uh, varied from time to time. Which led us, which led me to this conclusion that we need to look at them in both perspectives. So first, we're going to look at Edward the Edward the Elder. So he, 
supposedly was trying to claim the Mercian heritage. Uh, in Mercia, the greatest writer was um, Eld Eldhelm, and uh, King Alfred and his son were trying to incorporate the language of the Mercian charters into their own charters, because West, the West Saxon charters prior to King Alfred, the son, uh, the uh, the father of King Edward, were quite technical. Next one, please. Um, so there is even a term Adhelmian language. Next one, please. Um, and again, um, I'm not going to read the list. You can look at it uh, yourself. Yourselves. I'll just point out that this style is very form, both very formulaic, but at the same time very difficult and very. Uh, flamboyant, I dare say. It's very hard to read. Next one, please. Um, it is supposed that um, Edward and his father were using the style to claim the Mercian heritage since they appended Mercia, uh, since they annexed Mercia to their kingdoms. They secured it from the Danes. Uh, the next king would be our uh, book reading Ethelston. And we know that he was the he was brother-in-law of, of Emperor Otto the Great. His uh, uh, his his half sister was married to the emperor, and he it's not sure if he, he was trying to assume it from the imperial court, but it's definitely uh, his intention to uh, present himself as an emperor, even though this title was pre perhaps not used in the vernacular sources. In the written sources, however, it was used quite often, as long with as uh, as much as the titles of Basileos, uh, Imperator, Propugnator, Gubernator, Defensor, and ev everything else they could find. Um, surprisingly enough, Ethelstan did not uh, enjoy the unanimous um, approval of his policy. He was first elected again by the Mercian nobility because he was raised at the Mercian court, and so he was so to speak, at odds with the um, ecclesiastical establishment in Wessex, which is why, apart from one charter, there's no donations from him to the Winchester community, which is very strange. Um, next one, please. Uh, it is not inconceivable that Ethelstan, opposing, putting himself against these people of establishment, was trying to create a sort of administration that would, he could rely on, and this administration was to be the lay elite, uh, partly what I'm studying in my project, the things or the uh, mi ministers of the king who were working as his agents in the provinces. Uh, next one, please. Um, his style was very flamboyant, and the um, most known scribe is called Ethelstan A. We do not know if it was one person, if it was an agency. Most scholars believe it was just one scribe. Um, but anyway, if you take an iconic Anglo-Saxon charter, that would be Ethelstan A. Next one, please. This is what it would have looked like. Uh, as you can see, these charters are rather long. They usually account to about 300 words. And you can see that the witness lists are very, very, very long. Most of these people are those uh, named things, people who the king was relying upon in ruling the, the kingdom. Actually, I think uh, it was Ethelstan who held the record of having um, the record of things overall. Other kings would usually employ maximum up to 50 things at their councils. Ethelstan could have, could have uh, more than 100. Next one, please. Then we've got those two, the gramophone king and the uh, uh, cross-legging king, um, Edmund and Edgar. Next one, please. Sorry. Next one, please. Um, they were not as strong rulers. Um, ben Snook uh, refers to them, their time in power was wrecked by political instability, fractionalism at the court, and moral impropriety. Next one, please. Um, the court was dominated by the so-called ecclesiastical party. The three most prominent figures were uh, Bishop Oda, Abbot, and later Archbishop Dunstan, and uh, Bishop Kenwald, or Kuhn, Kuhnwald in uh, the West Saxon pronunciation. Um, and it seems like they were pushing the monarchs aside from the government, which is not surprising because, for example, King Edred spent most of his time ruling from his bed because he was very sick. Uh, so quite explicable. Next one, please. Um, and we can see three diplomatic styles in their reign. 
the so-called mainstream, the alliterative charters, and Dunstan B. Dunstan B is associated with, you guess it, Dunstan. Um, the alliterative charters are very interesting themselves. There are not many. There are maybe about 15 of them. And um, they are not pieces of poetry, but uh, they are very outstanding. They're standing out from the uh, main corpus. Next one, please. Um, the language became rather simplistic, though it was not crude, not at all. And the party, the ecclesiastical party, was, it seems, exploiting their position at the court. They were referring to themselves with very, again, flamboyant and quite um, flattering titles like the high bishop of whatever I want. Next one, please. Whereas the kings were just kings. Next one, please. Uh, this is, for example, what a charter from 948 would have looked like. You can see they're shorter. The witness lists are much shorter. And if you could read it, if we had more time, you could. Um, I could assure you that the styles are rather simple. Um, by the way, speaking of the um, structure, you can see that this, for example, uh, are the, bound the boundaries. So you can see that the script is a bit different. Here you have the Latin script, uh, the Latin language, and here it's in vernacular. Next one, please. Then comes uh, our King Edwig with his uh, threesome. Uh, it seems Ed Edwig was trying to put an end to this uh, chaos of uh, the ecclesiastical rule. So it seems that he dis, um, disbanded the previous chancery and employed a, com a new set of scribes. Um, action, please. Um, he was reshuffling the priorities in his formula. Next one, please. For example, he would refer to himself, I mean, not he himself, the scribe would refer to the king, for example, as Ergo Edwig Rex Anglorum Hoc Donum Cum Triumphu Sancta Crucis Impressi, whereas Order would be just ego order archiepiscopus consignari, um, and this is this is said to be not just a coincidence. This is said to be the reflection of the inner politics at the court. Next one, please. Um, uh, Edwig's charters uh, employed lots of uh, Grecisms, such as Basileus, um, but not only. Um, next one, please. And the charter would look like this. Unfortunately, this is not the finest reproduction I've got. Um, and unfortunately, it's not the prime example because usually they're longer. Um, but nevertheless, you can see the fine crosses over here, the short, the shorter versions of the witness lists. Yes, next one, please. Uh, then comes our neck-breaking King Edward, uh, King Edgar. Sorry, uh, King Edgar was a very different man from King Edwig. He was also very young; it was maybe one or two years younger than Edwig. But he was trying to balance out the uh, parties at his court. Next one, please. Um, the most prominent styles uh, are in number four. Next one, please. We've got these. Uh, I'm not sure the names would tell you anything, but believe me, they are very distinct from each other, which is, which is said to be the reflection of Edgar's inner ideas of how it should have how his court should have worked. He was trying to balance out all parties at the court. We've got a party of Dunstan, we've got the party of uh, the, we can call them lay scribes, the mainstream uh, charters, uh, and so forth. But um, as the events after the death of the king showed, this was only possible as long as the king lived. Uh, right, of his, right after his death, the old dogs under the carpet um, ran away and had a squabble among themselves. Uh, it's very interesting to know that the language of the charters uh, become, uh, becomes simplistic again, whereas the uh, ecclesiastical sources use the so-called hermeneutic style and it's very, it's very difficult to read. It's, very, um, it's the finest Latin you can find uh, in the British Isles at the time. And Ben Snook, whom I'm, uh, whose work I'm using a lot in this presentation, asserts that uh, this was again the reflection of how the bishops saw their position. We can write some technicalities for those uh, having powers, but we we are we have the, the we are the uh, we are the we are the establishment. So the style should belong to us, and those should, should just have some bureaucratic procedures. Thank you. Next one. Um, the charter um, that I took this picture from is actually a miniature, which is not a book, but not this is not how it's supposed to, which is not a book, but it is an opening page from one of the charters um, where King Edgar 
uh, founded the new minster. Next came King Ethelred, the unready king, uh, the ill counseled. Next one, please. So, uh, very much as his name is um, offering us a, a, an explanation of his rulership, it seems he had very bad choice of counselors. Uh, his court was dominated by at least three parties, but in, in fact there are more sub-parties in these periods. Uh, we've got the lay party, we've got the ecclesiastic party, and we've got one figure who um, outweighed his uh, colleagues, so to speak, the, the infamous elderman Edric Stjorna. His uh, by name can be translated as the greedy one, which says a lot about uh, Ethelred's choice of um, his entourage. Next one, please. Um, this led to a full chaos in the tenures because the lay party was expropriating the, ch the lands that King Edgar gave to the monasteries and to the church. Uh, later on, when King uh, Ethelred uh, became of, of age, uh, he atoned for his sins as he himself wrote in his charters and he was re redistributing them again. Then came King, uh, then came Edric Stuon, and he was trying to provide for his own family. So you can imagine what kind of chaos that was, especially given the circumstances of the reign that is the Vikings. So that was a full havoc, havoc in in those thirty years. Next one, please. Um, and in the formulas, we for the first time we find a very mundane explanation of why the king is donating this or that land to that or that grantee. Usually. The king explains that this land was unjustly appropriated by some layman who had no right for this land in the first place, and I am now giving it to the monastery, and then begin, begins the proem for the salvation of my soul, and so forth, so forth. Later on, the charters from 1990s uh, and uh, from 990s, and uh, thenceforth included the uh, nullification of the previous title deeds because it's it is assumed that there were many charters extend for one and the same estate. Go figure who has the right. Next one, please. And a charter would look like, mm -hmm, thank you. A charter would look like, like that. Uh, again, you can see that they are longer. Uh, the witness lists are again longer, but um, the majority of the space is occupied by the reasons of why the king is giving this or that land to that or, that or the other favorite of his. Next one, please. Then came King Canute. Uh, King Canute was from a different dynasty, and so it's, it is said that he did not need this justification because, as Charles Inslee put it, the West Saxon monarchy was trying to trick the nobility that they, um, it was like a kind of a propaganda. The patronage of the monastic houses was a sort of royal policy, whereas King Canute, who himself was Christian but came from a pagan family, perhaps did not feel that sympathetic with the church. I mean, he felt sympathetic with the church in terms of supporting it, but he was not very keen on giving the church to land. Um, next one, please. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I am speculating that it might have been due to the fact that the land there were no available estates, just for that reason, because if you can imagine, if the previous 100 years were filled with the grants, probably there were not enough estates left. Next one, please. Nevertheless, he had about 44 charters, which would look like that. And we can see that he fully assumed the position of an English monarch. English monarch. Next one, please. And finally, we've got Edward the Confessor. Uh, Edward had allegedly 66 charters issued. The majority of them are forgeries, later forgeries. Instead, we have a huge number of writs, which were a very different, for, uh, very different type of document. Next one, please. Um, maybe his chancery had some influence from Normandy, where he lived his younger years. Next one, please. Um, it has been it has been argued that it might have been due to the fact that uh, the king was relying on the writs and not on the charters that we see this decline. But I'm also speculating that it might have been that we do not have the charters preserved in the archives for a reason I could comment on in the discussion section. Um, next one, please. Uh, this is what a writ would look like. You can see that it's a different script. It's in Old English, and it's much, much shorter. Next one, please. And finally, in the three minutes I've got left, I want to talk about the, um, uh, the statistics, uh, because I think it's the strongest side of my uh, 
project in this respect. First of all, this is the, uh, I'm sorry for the Cyrillics here, I didn't have the opportunity to change it, but uh, here is the dynamics of the production of the charters of the donations of lands from uh, the year 900 to 10, well, around 1060, but 1066 actually. You can see the peak in King Edwy's reign. The red line is the donation in favor of the Thanes of whom I talked two years ago. Then we've got the uh, donations in favor of the church, this green one, and everyone else goes in the uh, blue line. Next one, please. Uh, and I have too many questions. I don't have the answers. For example, uh, why is it so? Uh, does it reflect the inner politics of the court? Does it reflect the social realities? Uh, is it economy? Why? Next one, please. Then um, the major question, of course, is whether our corpus is representative or not. Um, then we've got the uh, dynamic, the uh, geographical distribution. This is a table I put together for another presentation uh, earlier this year. We've, we can see that they, uh, the donations are concentrated primarily in Wessex. The Thanes had 68%, the church had uh, only a half, but unfortunately too many ch uh, church charters are dispu of disputed authentic authenticity. If you add up the disputed ones, you would have roughly the same numbers. Uh, and so forth. Why is that? To show it on the map, majority, the majority of the donations were concentrated here. Why not there? That's a good question that I do not have an answer to yet. Um, does it reflect any sociological, any social, any economical, or any political realities? Was it that the kings did not own the estates uh, east of this borderline? Was it due to the fact that the local uh, aristocracy would not allow to give out so much land? I do not know. Next one, please. Should I collect the questions or answer them? Right? Um, first, on the editions, um, the modern editions we have at hand are quite comprehensible. I only show the, uh, so to speak, the milestones. Um, the newer uh, series was uh, conceived in 1973. They have they have been published, uh, I think, 20 volumes right now. They are now pub published by archives. So we've got, a, for example, the Burton Archive, the Winchester Archive, and so forth, but it's far from a conclusion. Uh, the electronic story is very comprehensible, so it is easy to work with them, especially with the website. Uh, speaking of the titles, uh, from my knowledge, I cannot recall anyone else calling them these fancy titles. Maybe you can find some references in the correspondence with the uh, papal court, but I doubt it. 
in the English sources, for example, mm -hmm. the monarchs were usually referred to as just kings. Um, but uh, Ben Snook, whose work I'm using here in my own presentation, says that the charters were read aloud in front of the big audience, as I said, at least 100 uh, people at the court uh, simultaneously. And uh, people were probably, um, maybe it rang the bell, so to speak. Uh, and the second question was um, how the manuscripts. Come oh from? yes, how the, uh, well that's a, that's a painful topic because uh, um, if you ever see the queen, tell her thank you very much for Henry VIII who um, disbanded the monasteries because the cha the charters were preserved in the uh, monastic archives. They were for the most part they were copies in the cut cut uh, the cutlers, mm -hmm. um, and we do not know how many have perished. Uh, Simon Keynes, a uh, huge authority on the topic, says uh, very cautiously that we might have about 10% of what has ever been produced, but there is no guarantee. I'm, I myself i am going to use the Doomsday Book to try to compare the, the snapshot with the dynamics. But the, uh, um, can this explain the, uh, um, the dynamics? Uh, yes, I think it has some certain hand in this um, gunpowder uh, barrel, but I cannot say how much. Yes. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, two question for clarification. If I get right, you were underlining uh, the variation in the style of writing from one king to the other, and at one point, at least when you were speaking of Edgar, mm -hmm. you were saying, well, there were different uh, scribes, and, and they represent different parties. So the idea that the, the language uh, you use represents also a political, a political point of view. So I was curious to get to know if I get it right. And second, uh, how was the relationship between those who decide the line and the scribe that uh, put down the document in mm -hmm. practical terms? And the second is somehow related because of you pointed out this transformation in language uh, and style, and uh, I was wondering if there are other aspects that uh, change in the production of the uh, physical document mm -hmm. material, because mm -hmm. from this overview you touch just one type of document, mm -hmm. and it seems that only with Edward the Confessor there is the transition from one type of charter at the first look, they look quite the same in terms of uh, dimension and You're quite position right. of the material on the page so there was a sense of continuity from mm -hmm. one king to the other also was a bit surprised with also Nook that seems to apply so probably using the same entourage of scribes mm -hmm. for English things so if you can say uh, something more on that. Um, I will have to come back to many of the questions later in this discussion. First of all, the relationship between the scribe and the author of the charter, we do not know what it was. We do not know how it was organized. We can compare it to, for example, some procedures known from the Carolingian world, where a bishop would dictate to a corpus of scribes, um, sometimes parallel documents, but we have no clue. We don't even have the word chancellor. So there's a huge argument whether the, uh, a position, uh, the office of a chancellor ever existed. There's one chancellor mentioned under King Edward the Confessor, but it's definitely a foreigner whom he brought with him from Normandy. So there's a huge... We, don't, we can reconstruct the chancery and the office uh, and the relationship in, the, in this office only from the secondary material, from the educated guess that we can draw from the charters themselves. Uh, Again, Ben Snook had a very wonderful metaphor. Um, he said he wished he could know if Ethelston and Ethelston A, the scribe, uh, actually ever sat on the bench at the cup of ale discussing how to formulate another donation. But um, it's just a, an indicated guess of how it might have been. Um, the question of the physical dimensions and so forth, as I, as I said, and as you yourself mentioned, they're very monolithic in terms of uh, paper, um, parchment, dimensions, uh, folding, and so forth, which is another question of why this kind of very archaic document persisted for so long. Uh, why was it not changed earlier? Because it was quite cumbersome in, many, in, in, the, in the process of governing, it was quite cumbersome. Um, 
we so the, the diplomas do not change in their neither in their composition nor in the dimensions apart from maybe the script you can you can see the, the change from the earlier script to the later script uh, the other types of documents uh, for example the writs uh, it's supposed that they were derived from the charters because the charters were the, the diplomas were the first charters imported into England. But we do not know how people saw it themselves. We know that, for example, the writs were quite small. They were strips of parchment. They were rolled together and they had a seal appended to them. And the parchment was uh, folded that way that you cannot um, you cannot unfold it and fold it again and, uh, and uh, so that no one will, uh, will see that you've read the writ. And um, so it's, it's a big question of why the writs were not employed before, actually before Canute. Um, there's again a huge debate whether they were used as far back as uh, King Alfred's time. There's a vague reference to them, but the earliest writs we have are from Ethelred the Andredi and their provenance is disputed. Um, there were more questions? No. Okay, no. sorry. <laughs> We can discuss this at the coffee break. Yeah, thank you, thank you. As we <clears throat> just saw uh, yesterday, uh, charters are not pure text bearers, text transporters, but they perform authority and power in them, uh, in themselves, in their materiality, in the scripture, in the layout, in the uh, monogramma, in the seal, and so forth. We didn't speak about language, and so I was struck, as Mr. Ripon, by uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, language policy uh, in, in the, in the Anglo-Saxon charters, what do you think uh, about the mo what do you think about the motives? If uh, the chancery or the Ethelstan uh, personal, personally introduces uh, an old language of the flourishing times of Altel, mm -hmm. uh, that means a very complicated, sophisticated language that nobody could understand. What, uh, was this a, a kind of power policy, uh, the authority of uh, language, but the, the, the successor changed policy into a simple style? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was very, very interesting, uh, I think. But the motives of that. Yeah. And second, to your questions, I think that the change, uh, the decline of diplomas and the rise of writs uh, prefigures the tendency of English, uh, English bureaucracy and administration, where the writs became the, the, the most important instrument of royal, uh, of royal administration. And uh, yeah, the gifts, uh, the grants of land, you can't only give and grant where you have something to give. Uh, and maybe that the concentration uh, results from concentration of royal property. Mm -hmm. Um, should I add anything? Uh, add language it? policy. Yes. Language policy, yes. Um, is this a policy or...? Um, it de again, as I said, you cannot uh, separate the king or the, the person, of the, the persona of the monarch and their documents. Because we know that Athelstan was a very, quite authoritative ruler. Um, he might be connected to the murder of his half-brother who was, who was king for 17 days. Um, but there's no proof. Um, he seems to be a very um, I am the ruler here guy. And so we do understand that this was not a coincidence that in his charters we have this style. Um, King Alfred first employed Elhelmian style uh, because, the, because he, as far as we can reconstruct, and we have far more documents, for far more um, personal attitudes from King Alfred's time in his, for example, in his preface to uh, the translations. Um, he himself saw uh, he himself saw himself as a, um, a renovator of the olden days, of the golden age, which was uh, assumed to be before the Vikings ever came. And since in that time, Althelm was the, uh, the flower of the English nation in, this, in these terms. Naturally, naturally, Alfred used this kind of style. Edward used it as much, but for other reasons. And Athelstan had nothing else at hand, basically. Uh, as for, the, for his successors, it seems that they were just weaker rulers. And the parties at the court simply kind of took the strings of government in their own hands. 
and maybe they were not as educated as Athelstan. As far as we know, Athelstan was quite educated for his time. And um, he was a very prominent figure, being authoritative, a fearsome warrior who led the uh, the army in battle himself, and at the same same time a very cultured person, and I, an ideal absolute monarch, so to speak. Yes. Yeah, that sounds very cool. There's there's there has been recently uh, published his uh, biography by Sarah Foot uh, from early 2000s, as far as I remember. Yes. Um, uh, I'd like to know, uh, first of all, if uh, you yourself uh, found any important um, data for your project while studying the documents in its materiality compare, compared to the editions you mentioned. Um, I'm coming back to the questions of uh, yesterday, and, or before yesterday. Mm -hmm. Did you find any, you know, precise data from the layout, uh, the layout of the chapter? Yes, thank you for the question. It's quite relevant for my project. I myself do not work, for example, with the language. I use, I use it. I quote uh, other works. Uh, simply because you cannot leave it out. But I myself, first of all, concentrate on the statistical data. And I, yes, I do um, receive lots of. Um, thought-provoking uh, input, for example, um, as uh, Mr. Del Corno mentioned, and as it was um, uh, also mentioned um, later, it might have been that the writs simply superseded the charters, but I think, my, I myself think that I want to look at the Doomsday Book, which is this thick, and uh, it will take another year of my life, and maybe one of my kidneys. Um, but I want to look, of, for example, how many donations did King Edward the Confessor make? Because I have a feeling that the charters were simply not preserved, and this decline is an illusion. Simply for the, you can, you should really put it in the context. Imagine you are the Norman, you are a Norman baron who came with William the Conqueror. You are taking this land. You are not interested in the in preserving the, the former charters because you are taking it not by the right of succession, you're taking it by the right of force or by the right of donation. And so these charters never got into the monastery archives because they were not of interest. Um, and this is also very interesting for me to understand the relationship between, for example, the kings and the aristocracy. As, as we spoke of King Canute, um, we know, for example, that um, unfortunately it was not my discovery, but uh, I highly subscribed to it. Um, Catherine Mark in 1984 published a groundbreaking uh, article where she calculated how many uh, things witnessed King Ethelred's uh, latest charters and how many things witnessed the attested the uh, charters of King Canute. And it seems there were only 20 percent of um, uh, continuity. The, uh, the personal personnel of the aristocracy was completely wiped out. By the uh, by, King Swain's and King Canute's invasion. So yes, I do find them quite relevant, uh, especially in the light of statistics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the second question, if I may, okay. may I? Um, <coughs> about the dynamics of production of these chapters. Did you uh, think uh, about uh, uh, parallel movements in the production of uh, charters and in the production and circulation of uh, fine books, uh, especially um, illustrated books. You know that in, in the period you are interested in, uh, the Anglo-Saxon world produced a very original and inventive illusionistic style in, in painting, and it was really in advance to the rest of uh, of uh, of the West except the Ottonian court. There was nothing comparable in the quality. And probably uh, the Pyrenean, uh, you know, the, the art of the Iran and manuscripts, but that's all. And uh, 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 we, we can find in, in the Anglo-Saxon history such moments, uh, 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 chronological moments, and also territories where these uh, fine illustrative treasure-like books uh, in very sophisticated subjects were produced and probably there is a correlation in these two movements, but it's just uh, a kind of uh, reflection of mine. 
Um, you're quite right. Uh, there is a correlation, although it might not be as um, straightforward as one might assume. Uh, the absolute record of the number of chattos produced in one reign belongs to King Edgar, who over 16 years of his reign produced 164 chattos uh, alone, uh, including the forgery. I mean, including the contemporary forgeries and, and disputed chattos. Um, and we know that it coincided with the so-called the monastic um, renaissance, where when the I'm not sure if it is the majority, but a great deal of uh, of the extant manuscripts were produced in the monasteries, naturally. But um, I do not myself go into the relationship between the, for example, the schools and the chancery. As I, as I mentioned, for example, we know that the chancery existed, but we know it only using our, like, their byproducts in form of, uh, for example, um, secondary documents and in, in different references scattered over the sources. So it's very difficult to establish this relationship, but um, uh, there the, the definitely must be something. It's not coming out of the blue. It, you cannot just create the, the, the documentary culture without having a good foundation. I agree. We have time for one last question by Professor Boitzer. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. I feel myself very enlightened in this field. Uh, thanks to your magnificent uh, presentation and overview. My first question was what, what are particularities of your own view on these things, but I think you have begun already to answer it. I have, uh, thanks to the question of Professor Voskoboynikov, and I have understood already that statistics play a great role in your own approach to this uh, subject. But maybe you will add something more uh, beyond the statistics. And I have, uh, nevertheless, the second question also. It's a rather concrete, small question. It concerns this wonderful uh, uh, invocation uh, in nomine aime et uh, agia sophia. Could you tell something more exactly about uh, this particular form of invocation? Where, when, and why, and what uh, sorts of uh, what sort of well influences do you? Um, 